Nobody wants to go to an eight-hour class on communications. Uh, the, uh, the ones who do are not the problem because um, they usually already get it. Uh, procedural justice sounds like a fancy term. It really is very common sense. Uh, what procedural justice tells us is it matters to people if they're treated fairly or not. Um, anytime there is an interaction between human beings, one of the strongest needs humans have is to be treated fairly. Procedural justice is really uh, how we treat people in our process of decision making. Um, the research and anecdotal evidence from my own experience and talking to other officers, uh, really what we find is that uh, people are much more concerned with the process and how they're treated than they are with the outcome of the decision in the end. Procedural justice is basically a, a philosophy on um, how we treat people in the field of, it can be in any field, it could be in corporate America, but especially in law enforcement, um, procedural fairness or procedural justice basically says that people care more about how they're treated in an interaction uh, more than the outcome itself. So if, if somebody does offend and they ultimately need to go to jail or in a, in a prisoner jail setting, maybe that's taking somebody to lockdown. Um, they'll care more about how they're treated and be, be more compliant through that process uh, depending on how they're treated. So the concept of procedural justice uh, essentially is broken down into a few parts. Uh, we do one particular exercise when we do the training with our officers. Uh, I, I don't use this term, I won't, won't use the term I actually use, I call it the complaint session. And we actually bring our officers in and we have them write down uh, what it is that frustrates them about their job. We call it the challenges. What are the challenges that for you in this job? Uh, and they go through and they write out all the challenges. And then we start talking to them about how most of those challenges we face that make us frustrated as officers are because there's a breakdown in relationship or communication. And we draw out from those officers the fact that usually what breaks down is one of four elements. Uh, they either feel, when they're subject to somebody else's authority, they either feel like they didn't have a voice in the decision-making process before a decision was made or they feel like the decision-making process was unknown to them or it wasn't transparent, or they feel like it's biased, like the decision was made against them as an individual, not because of the behavior, or they feel like somewhere in the process it wasn't dignified or respectful in the way they were treated. So we call those the four pillars, and we know that we, we had the officers talk about their personal experience and how the department has treated them, or how the media has treated them, or how their spouse or significant other has treated them, and we talked to them about how this can all be challenging and can interfere with officer survival. Um, and then we, we circle back around and we talk to them about how important it is in all interactions to make sure that you meet all of those needs of the, the person. So now when we go out there in the field, we ask them to draw back to that time when they were frustrated with their boss or their spouse or somebody else they interacted with. And we have them relate that to their interaction with the public and realizing that usually when we inter interact with the public, it's on their worst day when they're in crisis. And if we can uh, think back to when we were in crisis and we were being uh, told to do something and how we felt, it helps us keep grounded in, in, in our response and to make sure that we're meeting those, those four pillars. I think for the most part, they listen. Um, they never seem to be above uh, the person that they're dealing with. They seem, they seem to almost to come down to the individual level and deal with them from a, a human standpoint not from an authoritative. We all have the authority. We, we have the authority when we don the uniform, but um, they have the ability to, to be human amongst it as well and immediately got respect that way, immediately. Being able to engage someone, especially in crisis or uh, in, an offender, to be able to, to show a little bit of understanding, show a little bit of empathy, hear their perspective, you know, what happened today? What's going on? What made you, what made you lose control today? Um, and allowing them, and one of the, the pieces or tenets of, of procedural fairness is actually um, giving them a voice in that process. So hearing them out before they think a decision is made. It'd be like the cop coming up, already having the decision, already having the ticket out. On a, on a traffic stop, right? They're like, the, the decision is made, so why even bother? But somebody that comes up and approaches and says, what's going on, why are you, why are you going fast today? Regardless of if they get the ticket or not, at least that, that officer heard him out. Same is true in the field of corrections. Uh, effective ones will give um, an inmate, an offender, 
a voice in that process. Now, there's a certain level of uh, reasonable resistance when we tell somebody to do something and they're resistant to that. We do, as in America, expect that people are going to maybe argue with this, uh, maybe uh, look for an avenue to, to complain about it, so on and so forth, and we need to be patient with that. Uh, it's very different when somebody's offering reasonable resistance versus somebody who's dangerous to us. And I think in our uh, police training, uh, we've uh, confused the two, and we haven't done a good job of helping officers understand the difference. When is re resistance reasonable, and when is it something that creates danger to us or somebody else? Uh, and the response to those two situations is totally different. Uh, but if we train our officers to tell the difference between a difficult person and a dangerous person and, and meter their response based on that, uh, I think it's going to keep us safe in the long run. I think intuitively a lot of us figured out how to treat people and how to gain cooperation and respect. Um, I think some officers have always struggled with that. And uh, again, I think procedural justice is a good blueprint for, for officers to kind of help them. So those of, those of us who get it, it's to reinforce doing things the right way. And for those officers who've kind of struggled with how to do it, it, it gives them a, a roadmap to help them be successful. Hopefully, hopefully we can get them early in their career and start them off right from the very beginning. We uh, actually titled our course uh, Procedural Justice, Communication Skills for Officer Survival because we believe that both in the short and long term, uh, building trust and respect is a way for officers to be safer in their job. I'll never compromise safety. I don't, see, you know, if somebody's uh, putting themselves in a threatening place or I have to act, you always have to act and keep the scene safe. But there's always the opportunity to come back and recover that relationship and say what happened here. It increases immediate safety, especially if you can talk to somebody in the moment and bring them down. There's uh, stories all over the place. You can. You can point to any one of those good officers and say, tell me about the time you listened and talked to an inmate, explain the process, treated him with neutrality, and how that turned out. Oftentimes it'll de-escalate. But in situations like that where maybe it doesn't um, de-escalate the situation and you still come back and recover, you're changing the image of the badge for the next person. You, you are helping promote that legitimacy so that Maybe they do feel that the system is a little bit just and maybe they should follow the rules or at least they understand um, the consequences when they don't. The idea of procedural justice takes the focus away from the individual and puts it on the decision making process. Um, it, you no longer as an individual who's being arrested or sent back to prison have the ability to blame your corrections officer. You no longer have the ability to blame society. You take ownership of it because procedural justice is a fair and impartial decision-making process. And if, the, the, if, if you know as an individual that that decision was fair and unbiased, uh, then you no longer have the ability to, to uh, resist it. Once you've got the situation under control, it's extremely important to conclude that interaction with the person feeling like they haven't lost their dignity. If you do not, you are planting the seeds for future resentment, resistance, and if you're in the law enforcement profession or the corrections profession, you care deeply about keeping your partner safe. And if you plant those seeds of resentment in a person who's just been arrested, one of your partners is going to reap the, 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 the revenge of that person who's had their dignity taken away. I used to hear that a lot when I started working in this field. Get in, get out, get to the next call. There's a lot of pressure to do things quickly. But when we talk about using procedural justice, listening and explaining, it takes five more minutes to talk to somebody and gain their cooperation than just you know, jumping into to a physical, physical fight. But when you think about it over the long term, if you get into a physical fight, you've got hours of paperwork. You perhaps are going to spend many, many more days in court. And you're, going to, you're not going to gain um, long-term compliance and long-term cooperation. So yes, at the front end, it takes about five more minutes to talk to people, but it's going to save you massive amounts of time on the other end. And more importantly, it, that investment of demonstrating respect by listening the, the benefit of that is you're much more likely to gain long-term compliance 
not just with that situation, but with the person feeling like, I really should cooperate with the entire program. You honestly have to fall in love with the Constitution. You have, to, you have to look at every person you come in contact with as a citizen of the United States and almost view their place in it. Not their current place, but what they could be. And uh, I, I honestly believe you take that approach, you're going to look at things a little bit different. They're not just inmates. They're not just parolees. Or they are citizens or could be.